Since the emergence of the genus Homo, humans have been messing with the landscapes in which we live. Fire was our first tool. We burned to create niches for hunting and foraging, and later, herding and farming. Some species suffered from our disturbances. Others, such as Matsutake, came to live with them. It's only recently, however, that the possibility that humans might destroy the habitability of the planet has been raised. The release of radioactivity at F Fukushima is one alarm call among many. The extinction crisis and the rapidity of global climate change are others. While species suicide might be the most efficient way to save the planet, it's useful to consider the alternatives. <laughs> Humans cannot live on Earth without disturbance. So we must consider what kinds of human disturbances can we live with without destroying everything. There seems to be a window of possibility for living together with other species. I don't think it can contain nuclear power plants with their inevitable accidents. But it can include human activities of landscape modification, including the Satriyama landscapes advocates hope to show us as a model. Matsutake show us this window limited by future histories of multi-species death on one side, but opening to life on the other. The mushroom cloud at Hiroshima still hangs over us. My book will trace landscapes made strange in the post-World War II light of potential annihilation. Yet I do not follow radioactive Matsutake. They remain a haunting shadow, making explicit the narrowness of the window I explore. My book will describe Matsutake's life-making trajectories. The ruins of my title are environmental destruction and human displacements, but since living is my topic, I steer away from, pro from programs for dying, which mark my limit point. What would it take to consider other species' life-making trajectories seriously, along with human histories? Such explorations run into a barricade, the separation between the human and natural sciences. Either we care about humans with their elaborate cultures and histories, or else we care about non-humans with their intricate natural laws. It's been almost impossible to ask about both. Given its robust history, any approach across this barricade is necessarily experimental. Mine begins with world making as a practice that humans and other species share. World making can only be explored with the combined insights of the humanities and of the natural sciences. This is because all living things, by virtue of being alive, participate in the making of worlds. <coughs> world making requires attention to human and non-human histories, social relations, and open-ended possibilities and constraints. From the perspective of any particular organism, that world in which it participates is a niche, an ecological living space. Niche making is part of the evolutionary history of every species. Without the ability to locate, augment, and perceive, preserve living spaces, species would die out. It's not just beaver that construct places to live, all species do. Fire, in my earlier example, helped make niches for earlier, early humans. Multi-species living is possible because niches interact in such a way to make living spaces for more than one species. Pines, with their associated fungal partners, often flourish in landscapes burned by humans. Pines and fungi work together to take advantage of bright open spaces and exposed mineral soils. They make niches both for themselves and for others. A world is such a space of interacting niches. My task is to consider the state of world making processes in which humans, pines, and mushrooms, as well as other species, can live. Worlds are spaces of encounter across difference, and organisms bring not only their biological capacities, but also their collective histories to these encounters. One history that shapes multi-species encounters almost everywhere today is the history of the human concentration of wealth through making both humans and non-humans into resources for investment. This history is capitalism. It's inspired investors to imbue both people and things with a quality one might call alienation, that is, the ability to stand alone as if niche-making entanglements do not matter. Through alienation, people and things become mobile assets. They can be removed from their life worlds and distance-defined transport to be exchanged with other assets from other life worlds elsewhere. This is quite different from merely using others as part of a life world, for example, in eating or being eaten. 
In that case, the entanglement of niches remains in place. But alienation <laughs> obviates entanglement. The dream of alienation inspires landscape modification in which only one standalone asset matters. Everything else becomes weeds or waste. Here, attending to world-making entanglement seems inefficient and perhaps archaic. To capital, worlds are disposable. When its singular asset can no longer be produced, a place can be abandoned. The timber has been cut. The oil has run out. The plantation soil no longer supports crops. The search for assets presume, resumes elsewhere. Thus, simplification for alienation produces ruins, spaces of abandonment for asset production. Global landscapes today are strewn with this kind of ruins. Indeed, investors are forced to search in the ruins of others' investment for further assets. The rest of us are reduced to making ruins our living spaces, the worlds within which we survive. The radioactive remains of the Fukushima power plant are only one of the many ruins we must navigate. Yet it's been difficult not only to discuss our life in the ruins, but even to see it for what it is. We want to believe that everything's getting better. We cling for hopes to hopes for progress, even when it has abandoned us. Meanwhile, capitalist investors own the rhetoric of progress, and they tell us that new investments, that is, new feats of alienation, will save us from earlier ruination. They teach us to ignore ruins in the making. To avoid this trap, it's worth exploring how capitalism works, and not just in its central places, but also at its limits. Here I need unexpected tools, tools to make, take me outside as well as inside what we tend to imagine as capitalist logics and forms. To watch life emerging from ruins, we need to see what escapes from asset production as well as what is captured in it. Imagining capitalism as a closed system is not good enough. Introducing alienation already implies this. Life could not continue if alienation were to be complete. Only because commodification does not fully and successfully capture the world is there life at all in ruins or any place else. It's not that I want to quibble about capitalist insights and outsides for the sake of definition. To assess the fate of living landscapes, we need to appreciate both the processes of making capitalist assets and the incomplete nature of this process. This means acknowledging both capitalist and non-capitalist features of life, human and not human. The term non-capitalist here does not imply the existence of encapsulated alternatives. Instead, it opens this, a discussion of how the life we have in all its contamination passes in and out of capitalist processes. This in and out is particularly clear in salvage, the search for assets in abandoned places. These places are lively despite earlier announcements of their death. A new round of commodification is possible because of the incomplete success of the older round, which allowed life to continue. U.S. Pacific Northwest forests are useful to think with here. As profitable uh, logging ebbs, commercial mushroom forests Foraging is one of the few ways these former industrial forests can produce capitalist assets. Yet what kind of capitalism is this? Mushroom foragers are nothing like the industrial workers we imagine. They're not employed by companies. They receive no wages or benefits. They are entirely on their own, working on their own time and for their own purposes. Are they inside or outside capitalism? Both are true. To watch the back and forth between capitalist and non-capitalist opens a critical analysis of capitalism to the problem of living in ruins, where incomplete commodification is the condition for further life. Getting outside an all-encompassing capitalist logic is equally important for understanding humans and non-humans. As long as we think of nature as composed of resources ready to be grabbed, we don't even notice life. Consider Matsutake. The part that can become a commodity is the reproductive organ, the mushroom. But the underground body of the fungus, which produces mushrooms, remains entirely outside capitalist control. At the moment, no one has figured out how to cultivate matsutake, so there are no protocols in place for the slightest capitalist control of the fungal body. But even if the mushroom could be cultivated, many aspects of its fungal life would still be outside human schemes. Matsutake is an icon for the dependence of all capitalist commodities on non-capitalist processes, such as life itself. 
to know the commodity form, we must venture back and forth through capitalist translations. If life can emerge in abandoned sites of asset making, it's because this back and forth is possible. Slow disturbance is one way of talking about the possibilities of humans living with other species. Slow disturbance landscapes are those not successfully simplified for the extraction of a single resource. They thus include multiple forms of life and not just domestics. Other species here are touched by the presence of humans, the ultimate weedy invader, yet they do not exist just to please humans. Like slow foods and slow science, slow disturbance is a mode of attention and a nod to process. Slowness is a call for more watchfulness rather than a cubbyhole for classification. Thinking through slow disturbance asks us to notice the multiple life trajectories that survive within human schemes, and yet without human control. Ruins, despite their terrors, are just where we might learn to appreciate slow disturbance. Living in ruins is a precarious form of survival, and it draws our attention to the help each living being needs to stay alive. No species makes it alone. We all require multi-species interactions. Ruins are also a place of unsettled identities. In ruins, we each become ourselves with the help of less than ideal collaborators. Individual kinds, as well as groups and arrangements, shift to navigate the insults of ruination. The ruins are not a place for stable property rights, even in oneself. Living in ruins means giving up on claims of ownership of self-contained identities, interests, and rights. But as a I'll explore later in my book, self-ownership was the underlying assumption of the progress sciences. When the sciences could identify self-contained and autonomous units, they knew how to imagine and even predict expansion and conquest. This helped make what one might call fast disturbance possible. The ruins and stability of kinds forces a reorientation of the scientific gaze toward precarious survival. In this sense, ruins are more than particular places. There are lens for changing our understanding of the world. Stable and self-contained units tied progress in the sciences to progress in the world through parallel dreams of expansion. In the wake of expectations of progress, it becomes possible to look for slow disturbance. Abandoned asset fields sometimes yield new multi-species and multicultural life. Of course, destruction can be long-lasting and thorough as radioactive landscapes remind us. Still, we don't have many choices other than looking for life in the ruins. Our first step is to bring our curiosity back, <coughs> and there's much to be curious about in slow disturbance. Unencumbered by the simplifications of progress, the knots and pulses of world-making entanglements are there for us to explore. Matsutake are a place to begin. However much I learn about them, they always take me by surprise. I'm going to skip to another section. Um, it's called Precarious Survival. <coughs> and uh, I want to begin it with a quotation from Hmong American writer Mei Nen Mua, who wrote a prose poem called Along the Way to the Mekong, in which uh, this line appears. I wanted someone to tell me things were going to be fine, but no one did. I was born in the most powerful country in the world at a time when it exuded confidence in modernization and progress. Of course, I didn't know about that then, but it shaped my childhood enough that I can conjure the gap between then and now. How strange that after all that progress, today we're concerned with plain survival. What looked before like the path to well-being now looks to many of us like smoking <coughs> ruins. Today we know our times is an age of accelerated extinction for other species. Some say half of all existing species will become extinct this century. Survival looms as an issue for these many species. Humans worry about survival too. In the global south, the question of how people can continue to survive the continued insults of resource theft and imperial and civil war is pressing. New land grabs, pollutions, out of control diseases and bombing campaigns are announced every day. In the global north, 
the demise of commitments to public welfare, socialist and non-socialist, has left most people vulnerable to every economic